Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to bring you the next installment in my ongoing series of videos all about the 90s PBS Kids TV show, Wishbone. If you've never seen Wishbone before, it was a very short-lived show. It only had one and a half seasons, but every single episode revolved around a famous work of literature or a short story or a play, just some sort of famous canonical work. One half of each episode would be dedicated to just being an adaptation of that work to show to kids. While the the other half of the episode was a real life modern storyline of a family living in Texas with their pet Jack Russell Terrier, Wishbone. In this series of videos I do here on my channel, I look at one episode of Wishbone per video. I compare it against the famous work that they chose to focus on in that episode. I try to see if they did it justice. I also try to point out what specific plot points the writers of each episode decided to highlight from the famous work, because in very few cases were they able to include everything from the famous work they were taking on. I also try to see if they attempted to extract any moral messages from the famous work in order to communicate to their very young audience. And at the end of the day, I try to make a judgment on whether or not it made for an entertaining half hour of television. In today's video, I will be looking at a mid-season one episode of Wishbone that takes on Walter Scott's epic tale, Ivanhoe, in an episode entitled Sniffing the Gauntlets. Let's take a look. What's the story, Wishbone? What's the story, Wishbone? What's this your dream? At the start of this episode, our three preteens, Joe, Sam, and David, are in class, and their teacher, wearing the uniform of every 90s teacher ever, tells the class that there's going to be a spelling bee. The class is split right down the middle into two teams, and they're each told they need to pick team captains by the next day. This introduction of competition leads Wishbone to present the book. Ivanhoe and give an extended description of the setting and the characters. The basic idea is that in England in the Middle Ages, there were the Saxons and the Normans, and they held tournaments in which they would compete against one another. There are some complicated dynamics within this cast of characters. Two characters are outcasts, and they're accompanied by a mysterious knight who challenges the current champion. Meanwhile, in Texas, our very own Samantha is chosen to be team captain for the spelling bee, which is only intimidating to her because the captain of the other team, Amanda, seems to be out for sixth grade blood. The next day when the competition gets started, the two teams slowly dwindle down to two members per team before the period ends and the finale gets postponed until the next day. While they're studying that night, the three kids decide to up their energy levels by eating protein bars that David has in his bag, but unbeknownst to all of them, those bars contain coconuts. And Sam is allergic, so the next day she is not up to going to school, so David, who we've been led to believe is not the best speller, has to take her place. In the book adaptation, there's another injury. The mysterious knight, aka Wishbone, wins the tournament, but he's hurt while he does so. The outcasts, Isaac of York and his daughter Rebecca, take him under their care, and eventually they start traveling with the prince and his escort, until the whole group of them are captured by Saxons. The jester Wamba escapes and goes to get help, but the prison that they're in goes up in flames, and later Wishbone has to fight for Rebecca's life and honor after she's accused of being a witch. He wins, of course, and saves her life. There's a big win back in Texas as well. The spelling bee is once again underway, and it has all come down to David and Amanda. Amanda forgets an L in miscellaneous while David gets it right and secures their team the W. The boys rush to Sam's house after school to tell her the good news. It turns out she's feeling much better, especially after hearing that David secured the win. Sam is still worried that Amanda might give her a hard time about missing school that day, but the guys assure her that they told Amanda that Sam taught David everything he knows about spelling. So let's talk about this episode a little bit, beginning with the moral message, because this episode ended on one, standing up for and being there for your friends. The scenes we get from Ivanhoe throughout this episode very much reinforce that our side versus their side type of mentality. And I think it's pretty clear in the scenes that we see that Ivanhoe needed Isaac and Rebecca as much as they needed him throughout this episode. And I think that is pretty clearly reflected in the real life 
Reeves storyline, where there are these two teams duking it out to see who's going to be the champion of the spelling bee and David needing to step in when Sam had to take a sick day. I really like that message, especially for kids. I think that would really resonate with kids. But I do think it's quite unrealistic to show kids caring so much about who wins a spelling bee. I think kids would care in the real worlds if it affected their grade or if the winners of the spelling bee got extra points on their next test. I could see them caring if those things were the case. But Amanda, the captain of the other team at one point says, I guess we'll see who the best speller is tomorrow. Calm down. Before I say anything else, let me just say that I really did enjoy this episode. I thought it was entertaining. But when I was watching it, I felt confused. And not because anything in the episode was unclear, but because Ivanhoe is such a strange choice for this show. I can see that they chose it because they wanted the tournament aspect to it and the friendship element. They wanted to include those things and communicate them through a modern storyline. But it actually got me to thinking about what the actual purpose of this show was. Because I do think the core purpose of this show was to demonstrate to kids that the stories contained within these books are very human and very relatable. These books aren't just dust collecting tomes that have nothing to do with your life. Their content will feel very familiar if you translate those stories to a modern or what was modern 25 years ago type of storyline. But I also think that there is a secondary and more subtle purpose of this show, and that's to get kids interested in picking up these books when they get a little bit older. I mean, I know that I saw the Wishbone episode that focused on the Odyssey, which I've already covered in this series. I saw that, I think, in my elementary school or middle school years. And then I remembered that episode when we picked up the Odyssey when I was in ninth or 10th grade. And I know I can't be the only person to have been reminded of a Wishbone episode when they go on to pick up that book later on. But that kind of leads me to my point in that I see Wishbone episodes as primers, as very short introductions to these famous works of literature that you could reasonably expect a good number of children to go on to read later on in life. A number of the Wishbone episodes focus on books like that. They're going to seem very familiar. A lot of these books are going to be on the 100 books to read before you die type of lists. But I have to ask you, and I actually am asking here, please let me know if I'm way off base. I don't know if we can expect kids in high school and college to even want to pick up Ivanhoe because I am someone who's read a ton of classics. This Wishbone series has inspired me to continue reading a lot of classics, which I'm very grateful to it for. But if even someone like me, who's very, very used to reading the language of the classics, if someone like me struggles with a book like Ivanhoe, which I definitely did, I don't know that we can expect younger people to want to pick this book up. And since I mentioned the Odyssey episode before, allow me to also say that this episode of Wishbone felt remarkably similar to the Wishbone episode that focused on the Odyssey. I mean, a returning hero in disguise fighting for the honor of a woman. That's literally the part of the Odyssey that they focused on in that episode. They did leave out a lot from the book, of course, because of time constraints. I always have that complaint because I want to see more from the book, but I always recognize that it's not an entirely valid complaint because I see what they were working with and they just couldn't have included everything. There was enough from the book to make it recognizable as Ivanhoe, but there was one plot point that they left dangling that absolutely just ate at me because at one point we see Wishbone as Ivanhoe alone, stranded in the burning castle. And then the next time we see him in the episode, he's fighting for Rebecca's honor. And there's no mention of how he went from that one place where we thought he was going to die. And then all of a sudden he's not only alive, but well enough to be fighting for Rebecca. We know in the book that he's saved by King Richard, but they don't even mention it in the episode. And it really bothers me. Maybe I'm the only person who would be bothered by that, 
but I was bothered. I think what saved this episode was definitely the real life storyline. I loved seeing the spelling bee go down, even as ridiculous as I found their behavior sometimes. I did really like seeing it. It was cool to see what words were featured because I'm a word nerd. But I think I loved it mainly because we get to see a lot of group dynamics between the three main teenagers, Joe, Sam, and David. I think those three kids are such amazing actors and they have such a great group dynamic on camera. So any episode where I get to see them as a friend group, I'm always a big fan of that. So overall, I do think the two storylines, the real life storyline and the book adaptation, I think that there was enough connection between them to make them feel related, to make the whole unit feel cohesive, which is always something I look for out of a Wishbone episode. And I think the moral message was simple, clear, and effective. I really, really liked that. But then on the other hand, this episode was kind of samey. It felt like something that they had done just very recently with the Odyssey episode. And I remain unconvinced that Ivanhoe is a book that kids will want to pick up or need to pick up later on down the line. So a bit of good, a bit of bad. We are straight down the middle. Very appropriate for a book set in the Middle Ages. So those are my thoughts on this episode of Wishbone. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen in this video or about anything in general, please feel free to put those in the comment section below. But if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on social media and some other places around the internet. The links to everywhere that you can find me will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Video. Bye. Funding for Wishbone provided by annual financial support from PBS viewers like you.